Hi everyone, if you are new to this channel, this is Sharan. I am a data scientist with over 10 years of experience. I have authored two books in data science. For more details, look into the description. If you are interested in learning more about data science, please subscribe to this channel. In this video, we are going to see about the clustering algorithm. Okay, what is a clustering algorithm? Clustering algorithm is one of the unsupervised learning, which means that we need to draw the inference from the data without any labels. So let's take an example. So let's say we have height and weight of a number of students. So let this be the height and let this be the weight of the students. So we have a number of students. Whose data are distributed across this. So what this clustering algorithm helps us is clustering algorithms helps us in grouping all the similar data together. So something like this. So it helps us in grouping all of these data together and identify the various clusters that is present in the data. So the third important thing is how do we come up with the number of clusters. So here in clustering algorithm the number of clusters is an hyperparameter, which means that it is not being derived from the algorithm as such, but it is being provided as an input to the algorithm to help in the learning process. Now we know what is the clustering algorithm. So now let's pick up an example. Let's pick k-means algorithm as an example and then see how this algorithm works. So in order to start with the k-means algorithm, we need to first determine k, which is the number of clusters. So there is a method in order to determine the value of k. So we call that method as an elbow method. So in this elbow method, what we do is we iteratively see uh, as we increase the number of clusters, how the distortion is reducing and using this pattern, we identify the ideal value for k. So the, uh, the plot for elbow method will look something like this, where y axis is the distortion and then the x-axis is the number of clusters. So for this particular data set, let's say we have only one cluster. So our centroid would be rotated somewhere here. So what is the centroid? So centroid is the center point for this particular data set. So for this data, the center would, would be rotated somewhere here. So now in order to calculate the distortion function, what we do is we identify the distance of each and every single data point that is present here to the centroid that we have identified. So the summation of all the distance is the total distortion. So when we have only one cluster, so the distortion would generally be very high. So now what we do is we iterate. So we assume that there are two clusters. So then in this data set, what would happen is when we have two clusters, the centroid would be somewhere here. And we would have some line like this where every data point that is towards the left of this particular line would be considered as part of this cluster. Let's call it as C1. And every single data point on the right hand side of this line would be considered as part of this cluster, which we call it as C2. So now similar, similarly, we identified the distance of each data point within this cluster to the centroid and for this cluster as well. And we add up both of them together. So now what would happen is when we have two clusters, ideally the distortion would slightly reduce. And let's say for this particular data set, we have three clusters, which is here and here and here. So what would happen is the distortion would further reduce. When we have n number of clusters, where n is the number of data points that we have, which means that each every single data point is considered as a cluster by itself. So then what would happen is we would reach a point where the distortion is zero. So if I am going to plot this, this chart would look something like this. So until a certain point, it drastically drops. And after a point, what happens is the drop reduces significantly. So now using this method, what we are doing is we are identifying the point where there is a last huge drop and after which the drop is reduced significantly. So this is the point that is required for us. So we identify this and then we use this for the value of k here in our algorithm. 
So that's how we use the elbow method in order to determine the value of k and then use in our k-means algorithm. Before going into the steps involved in the k-means algorithm, I just want to explain one simple concept. So when explaining the method used to determine the value of k, I was explaining the distance between the centroid and the data point. So how do we actually calculate this distance? So the method used for calculating the distance is called as Euclidean distance, which is nothing similar, uh, nothing different, but similar to the Pythagoras theorem. So let's take an example here. So let's take the same two dimension where we have weight and height of a student. So this is the uh, data point and we have a centroid here. So now in order to identify the distance between this data point and this centroid, we imagine that there is a line here, then there is a line here. So now this becomes a right angled triangle. So in order to identify the distance, let's say z, so let's say this is a from this point to this point, and then this is p. So z is nothing but equal to square root of a square plus b square. So now let's assume instead of two dimensions, there are three dimensions, which means that in addition to weight and height, we have the age of a particular student, so which is c. So now what happens is the distance would be a square plus b square plus c square, which is this particular distance. So this is the method that is used to identify the distance, which is helpful in order to determine the value of k, which is passed as an input to the k-means algorithm. So now let's get into the details and the steps involved in the k-means algorithm. In order to go through the steps involved in the k-means algorithm, let's consider a very simple example. So we use the same weight as well as the height. But here, what we consider is we consider the height of the uh, data points are exactly same, whereas the weight varies. So now we will go through the steps involved in the k-means algorithm. So let's assume that we have already determined the value of k. So let it be three. So there are three clusters in our data set. So now first what we do is we randomly plot, plot the centroid of the three clusters. So let's say we plot the centroid here, here and here. So now after plotting the centroids randomly, the, what the algorithm does is the algorithm computes the distance of the data point that is closest for each of those centroids. So now the algorithm would consider this as a particular cluster, this one as a particular cluster and this as the third cluster. So now, next what happens is compute the centroid of each cluster. So now we have identified the cluster. So now for this particular cluster, we identify the new centroid. So what would happen is the position of the centroid would shift here to somewhere closer to here. So this would be the new centroid. In this case, there is only one data point. So this would be the new centroid and here the new centroid would shift from here to somewhere here. So after computing the new centroid, what happens is for the new centroid that we have calculated, so in this case, this one, we again identify the distance between the data points to the new cluster. So now what would happen is there will be a small change. So here, only these two points would be considered as part of this particular cluster. And since this centroid has moved from here to here, this point would be closer to this. So it would join a new cluster. So from here, it moves to here. And here, there wouldn't be any change, but the centroid would have been moved here. So now what happens is we iteratively repeat the same step until we don't see any changes in the uh, data points assigned to a particular cluster. So that's called as the convergence. So when we reach the particular state where when we iterate and then there is no change in any of the clusters, the data points still remain with the clusters that they belong to the previous time. So that's when we stop and then we finalize the clusters that has been identified. So this is the steps involved in the Tremens algorithm. So far we have covered the definition of the clustering algorithm as well as the step-by-step -step process involved in building the Tremens algorithm as well as the math behind it. So now the next most important question so what? Why can I apply the clustering algorithm in real life? Okay, let me show you some of the use cases where we can apply the clustering algorithm. Uh, the first one is customer segmentation. This, this is the most common one. When we want to group all the users based on their similar behavior, 
of course, trusting our algorithm prompts very handy in uh, coming up with this all the clusters. Let's say we have millions and millions of documents or images and we don't want someone to manually go through them, but we want to group them into different categories. Of course, trusting algorithm again can be used here. And uh, let's maybe pick up something that we use on a regular basis, maybe Spotify. What Spotify can do is, depending upon the taste of the users uh, and the similarity of the music that they hear, they can come up with the clusters so that uh, customized marketing campaigns can be launched for all these uh, users. So these are all some of the examples where clustering algorithm can be applied in real life. If you learned something new today, please like this video and subscribe for more similar content. Thank you. And uh, in the next video, I'll be explaining you how to implement this clustering algorithm using Python, which I'll be attaching uh, here, maybe somewhere on the top or uh, somewhere in the screen. Thank you.